Thank you, thank you very much. I'm very excited uh, to be able to do this presentation uh, through the Sifriya Leumit Beyushalayim. It is an institution that I would often cross on my way uh, walking from the Givat Ram campus to uh, other places, the hotel where I worked, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, uh, and I know that for uh, Bully, for Aleph Bet Yoshua, the Sifriya Leumit is very important. That's where he has placed his archive. Uh, in, in fact, just a month ago, he asked me to send him uh, another copy of my book that recently came out, the, the Retrospective Imagination of Aleph Bet Yoshua, because he says he wants to make sure that it's in his archive at the Sifri Aleph Meet. Um, and one of my chapters in the book is based on a discovery that I made uh, in that archive. But, um, the topic of, 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 of our discussion today is uh, the fine line between dispersion, or maybe we should rather say diasporization, and globe trotting in uh, Joshua's opus and ethos. Uh, the world, according to Aleph Bet Joshua, uh, we can say. And the reason why I chose this topic is that. It is ironic, uh, especially in light of Yoshua's views about uh, diaspora, Jewry, and Israelis who live abroad. Uh, it is ironic that I or, or anyone else should be sitting in a diaspora, in my case, I'm in Montreal, uh, talking about Yoshua and not uh, uh, arguing against this idea of diaspora, but rather explicating his views about Israeli sovereignty and Israeli identity. That is what matters to Yeshua. All his views about the diaspora, about everything else, relates to the construction of a modern uh, uh, Jewish national sovereignty in Israel. And to me, that is also what matters. Uh, in addition to uh, loving the, the, the masterful uh, uh, way that Yoshua writes and, and imagines things. And so I have taken upon myself to explain it in greater depth. So just uh, to refresh your memories, if you signed up for this talk, uh, you probably are aware that Yoshua is quite hostile, <laughs> we could say, to diaspora Jewry. Um, and especially is frustrated with the old deem. Hostile, but he talks with them. He tries to explain to them. He tries, he always dialogues, is always open for conversation, much more so than any other living or uh, or dead uh, author. He is always wanting to establish a dialogue with people from anywhere of all ages in all situations. Uh, well, there are a few exceptions perhaps, but uh, pretty much that is the, the rule for him. Nevertheless, his dialogue with the diaspora, with diaspora, he doesn't have a dialogue with diaspora jury. He just has an opinion. Uh, and his opinion is that diaspora Jews do not have a full national Jewish identity. But the way he says it is, is, is not the way I'm saying it. He says, you guys, you guys are, are, are partial Jews. Even the most religious Jew in New York City with the payas and the learning Talmud all day is a partial Jew compared to a secular Jew in Tel Aviv who, who is responsible for Israeli uh, uh, decisions and participating fully in Israeli decisions with Israel understood to be a Jewish state. And he keeps saying that it gets people really riled up and angry. Uh, uh, so he has clarified, for instance, that a religious Jew 
let's say the cousin of that ultra orthodox um, religious Jew from uh, New York or Antwerp, Antwerp, that cousin who lives in Jerusalem, let's say, an ultra orthodox Jew in Jerusalem, that that per person, even though he may live his life almost the same way that his cousins do in Antwerp, ultra orthodox Haredim in Antwerp or, or New York, that one that is in Jerusalem has a much more comprehensive and important Jewish uh, life because everything that he does as, a, as Jewish practice uh, has repercussions in a political uh, uh, pragmatic way on the identity of the state of Israel and its present and its future. So that, that's, that's, that it's important to understand what he's actually trying to say when he says partial Jews and full Jews, what it is. He says it without really explaining it. We can talk about it more at the end in the Q&A. Um, but just to remind you, uh, about six years ago, for example, the American author, um, um, uh, uh, Nicole Krauss, uh, came to Israel and there were talks and he again said this to her and some people uh, in Israel and, and in diaspora were very upset that he was not nice to her, that she speaks very politely and quietly and, and, and he was not polite and not quiet and he just said his usual thing, which is that you diaspora Jews uh, are playing with Judaism, even if you go to the synagogue, uh, you know, every day or however many times a day, and even if you learn Gemara all day, you still have a, a lesser, it calls it partial Jewish identity compared to an Israeli that is, is he says, married, married to the Jewish state, married to Jewish decisions every day. That's his opinion, <laughs> uh, um, and and it's he it, it gets into trouble all the time because of it. In two thousand and six, uh, he was invited to participate in the keynote panel that that was celebrating the hundredth year anniversary, the centennial of the American Jewish Committee, which was founded in Washington, and it was meeting in Washington. And um, there were all these distinguished speakers and then Yeshua took to the podium and he said to them exactly these things. You are partial Jews. You're playing with Judaism. I'm married to it. The, the people's jaws dropped. Um, he told them also, then when they started to argue with him, he said to them, he said to them, if uh, Israel ceases to exist, and I come here uh, to this to the North America a hundred years later, and I see that you guys are thriving. He says, um, "Then, you know, I, I don't care." He says, "I'd hardly cry uh, if you were thriving or not. If you were not thriving, though." He clarifies that he does think that Judaism and Jews will continue to exist. He says they'll open up a minion in Mars. And he might be right. He might actually be right. And this is now starting to be possible. He says, so he's not worried about Jewish survival. What he's worried about is the character of the Jewish state. And that he doesn't quite manage to convey this. So when he had this, when he said these things at the American Jewish Committee, uh, and of course, they thought he, there was going to be some kind of celebration, and he dampened the, <laughs> the party. But so many people reacted in depth. Uh, Shulamit Aloni, Andy Lel Halkin, who's his translation, translator, and rabbis and leaders of Jewish organizations all over the world, and politicians, Yossi Sarid, everybody responded to Yoshua in writing, in the newspapers. That was in 2006. They all, many of them agreed with him. Many of them challenged him. Many of them 
uh, nuanced his, his attitudes. Uh, this is a very rich, uh, he ignited a, a debate and a rethinking of the issues. And this was published, you can find it online if you Google the Yehoshua controversy. And it's just a PDF document that was published online by the American Jewish Committee, Alfred Moses, the uh, head of the American Jewish Committee at that time said, I invited Yoshua because I knew he would ignite debate. And boy, it was like an international storm. And then he apologized. He published the apology in like the Washington Post or something like that. And then that is also included in, the, in that compendium. It's a very good food for thought. And it's the background of part of what I am going to show you today. Um, um, and in, in, in my book, uh, The Retrospective Imagination of A.B. Yoshua, um, here, I'll start, I'll start screen sharing. In this book uh, that was just published, uh, there is a coda, there is a last chapter uh, that is written in the style of Marmani, of Mr. Mani, which is conversations be bet uh, between an older uh, a person with authority and a younger person uh, who's trying to understand things. And you only hear the words of the younger person in, in most cases, in four of the five conversations. So in my coda, you only hear my, my voice. It's a little, uh, you know, playful thing. <laughs> And 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 uh, I am arguing with Yoshua about these things and about what he said at the American uh, um, Jewish Committee. So uh, if you if you look at that book and you look at that last little bit six uh, pages in the coda, you can get more of the opening up of the issues in the discussion uh, regarding. Uh, that moment, uh, which was his most uh, severe clash with, uh, with with the diaspora on those issues of being a partial Jew, full Jew, um, and so forth. You might also know that early on in his life, he published an essay called uh, the, the Gola Neurosis, um, uh, the Diaspora Neurosis, in which he argued that because there are so many rules and regulations for Jews based on uh, Vodat Hashem and uh, that he's not talking only about the things like Shemitah and the laws that are related to the land of Israel, but about the relationship of each Jew with the land through God, because God supposedly gives you the land now you have these responsibilities the way you see the relationship um uh, worked out through the prophets through through Yermiao especially let's say um that says you know you've gone astray you had a covenant with god god gave you the land now because of you not you know behaving properly so you're gonna lose it so he says there's so much stress involved with being in that land that belongs to god that jews escape to the diaspora that's why he calls it a neurosis because it's an escape rather than wrestling with the problem wrestling with god with the idea of god and becoming pragmatic so these are uh, Yoshua's very, very harsh uh, views about um, the, 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 the relationship between the land of Israel and Jews outside of it, the relationship between Israelis and the diaspora and so forth. But what I actually want to do in our, in our meeting today is not to rehash all these controversies, Yeshua's arguments and blind spots. But what I actually want to do is talk in greater depth about Yeshua's actual representation of the relationship between Jews, especially Israelis, because his characters are Israelis normally, 
and the world. So how uh, do Jew, what is the relationship to Jews and the world across Yoshua's opus and ethos? So you may have noticed um, that in almost all of Yoshua's, um, almost all of Yoshua's um, novels and short stories, he, 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 the characters go somewhere. If you've read any of these books, novellas, novels, etc., think about the Israeli characters who actually go somewhere. And there's only two of them, Journey to the End of the Millennium and their most recent, Abate Erida, um, the, for the only daughter uh, that are set in the, actually in the diaspora and where the protagonists are diaspora Jews. All the others, the protagonists are Israelis. Uh, no, sorry, the extra is an Israeli who lives abroad, but all the others are Israelis who live in Israel and who, and who have these voyages. And that's what I want to emphasize today. Um, here, you can see we've put all of Yoshua's major novels. This was done before the last novella came out. We've put them on the map of the globe. And it's rather remarkable, isn't it? in light of everything that we were just saying about his attitude towards dispersion and Jews living abroad. Remarkable that nevertheless he chooses to send his Jews, his Israelis, to every far-flung location around the globe. We might expect that someone with his uh, point of view on the perils of diasporization um, would situate um, the native consciousness in its immediate locale, as Samir Hizhar did, for example, and many other writers of the generation that fought for the establishment of the state. Everything happened in Israel was a local Israeli story. Yet Yeshua, in almost all his novels and novellas, does choose to send his main characters sometimes for the majority of the plot, to all these far-flung locations, to Tanzania, to, um, to um, all sorts of places in Europe, Berlin, London, Paris, to the former Soviet Union that's in uh, mission, uh, mission of the Human Resources, uh, translated as a woman in Jerusalem, to uh, Spain, as you know, in the retrospective, to India in Hashiva Mihodu or Open Heart, uh, a little bit to Japan for a concert performance in the Extra, and that also happens in, in, in the Netherlands. Uh, and so this is kind of a paradoxical. And that's what I want to, uh, to, to weigh in on. So voyages in Yoshua's uh, fiction are both an asset and a liability. We can see in Yoshua's plots, and if you signed up for this talk, I, I hope, I, I think you probably have read some of Yoshua's uh, books. So uh, you know that there are many benefits to the characters who travel outside of their hometown, outside of their bubble. What do they see? Who do they meet in these voyages? So they meet, for instance, Tanzanian anthropologists and other African anthropologists searching for uh, the origins of mankind in their own soil. They meet Hindu doctors who are perfectly well trained in um, Western medicine, but are also maybe dressed in their 
uh, traditional garb or, and, and follow their traditional practices. They meet Japanese and Dutch musicians with whom they have interactions. They meet Spaniard priests and monks uh, who are struggling with, with religion uh, and modernity, with national identity and other identities uh, through uh, refugees that are coming and immigrants uh, and they're struggling with their past uh, with their with their uh, um, junta past the, 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 the dictatorship and so forth forth they meet uh, former military personnel in the former Soviet Republic and here the emphasis is in former and they when they meet a former military personnel in a former Soviet Republic, maybe they see that certain things that were not so uh, peaceful, not so moral can change. But of course, uh, 20 years later, they can change again. <laughs> so it's very interesting to read all this. Uh, you know, to go back to these wonderful novels by great authors like Yoshua, to understand his ideologies, ethos, and to the dialogue continues and changes every time we read them again. Uh, so uh, the scholar Risa Dom, who was uh, based in England, she, she pointed out that Yoshua is very anxious for Israel to define its borders to have clear boundaries but he wants the, those borders to be permeable so clear clear identity clear but permeable borders and uh, in his in his uh, discussion with uh, the intellectual Marsh, marshal berman yoshua and, and and marshal berman was arguing along the lines that you probably wanted to argue when I was first talking about what Yoshua says about the diaspora. And, and, and Yoshua said to him, look, yeah, we have to have an identity and it has to have clear borders and we have to have an Israeli identity, which is different from a Jewish identity that can spread everywhere. But that doesn't mean that we are hermetic. Borders have gateways and crossings. And the, these, the characters, these really characters who go through those gateways and crossings, they, just a second, my daughter here is talking loud, <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, and so, and so um, the, the characters who take advantage of those, of those gateways and crossings, they, um, they acquire, a heightened sense of cultural and historical perspective. It's a fantastic opportunity for Yoshua to show what one can learn from interactions with individuals and groups from other religions, other ethnicities, other races, other nationalities. On the other hand, he fears the diaspora option. And we see in all of these novels that the di that diaspora option is a, that 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 going on these voyages is risky there's a possibility of perdition illness loss the characters are often it's not sure what's going to happen are they going to fall in love with somebody are they going to fall in love with that place are they ever going to come back that again in light of the diaspora neurosis that um, Yoshua feels may once again pull Jews away <clears throat> from confronting all the challenges of reconfiguring a modern Jewish identity in Israel. So when he sends his characters abroad with no clear mission or date of return, and sometimes they do have a clear date of return, a dilemma arises regarding their allegiances and responsibilities towards their family members and even towards their national heritage in all its dimensions, the civic life in Israel and the religious traditions. So for, to, to explain to you what I mean by by a dilemma arising 
uh, also uh, not only vis-a-vis -vis their responsibilities towards their family members, but also vis-a-vis -vis, uh, their uh, religious traditions. Take the example of uh, Shiva Mihodu, Open Heart, uh, which uh, in, in English the title is Open Heart, in most other languages it was translated more faithfully, Shiva Mihodu more or less, that much of it occurs in India. There is a character there called Michaela. She's extremely attracted to the Indian pace of life. She is somebody who did not graduate from high school, but in Calcutta, she volunteers to help the sidewalk doctors. These are doctors from the West who are just treating anybody who needs help and a lot of people there need extra help. Um, they're treating them sort of on the sidewalks, uh, sort of doctors without borders, and she helps out. So her very kind and intelligent mother-in-law recognizes that Michaela, who in Israel does not have a sense of direction, a sense of vocation, feels valued and feels um, that she be that, she, that, 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 that there's purpose to her life over there outside, uh, outside of where there's pressure to finish high school, to do the bagot, to go to the university, to get a job, to get married, to have children, to be a good um, Yiddish mommy. So this is, in a sense, you could you could ask whether this is a an example of the Gola neurosis. She flees. And over there in India, she has a very rich life. Then somehow she ends up marrying this doctor, if you wrote, wrote, read that novel, and then she goes back to India. She goes back with her little tiny, you know, infant daughter, three months old or something. And there she is, you know, touring India and helping out the people, the Israelis who are there, tourists and also the Indians. And that's the, the, part of the stressful aspects of the plot. What is she doing? Is the baby going to get sick? Is the baby, is she going to come back? Is she going to bring back the baby? Um, there are more, there are more extreme examples. Yoshua is kind to Michaela, but there are more extreme examples of characters such as Yuda Kamika in a late divorce, um, and hear, hear me in a friendly fire. Uh, he's not so kind to them. Uh, here you see those who do not return. So these are Israeli characters who leave. We do not know. Michaela goes to India. We do not know at the end of the novel whether she will return. Uh, hear me. I'll read to you in a little bit what he says. He does not want to return. It's clear that he will not return. And Yehuda has really escaped from his problematic family and has made him even more problematic because of that in a late divorce. He, he's gone to America. He's, he's sort of abandoned them. Now he comes back because he wants a divorce. He wants a divorce from the mother of his grown children, he wants to marry this other woman. Um, and he wants, he just comes and he's very eager to leave but he gets murdered uh, before he's able to leave. So he was just about, he was on his way to the airport, but he doesn't quite get to leave. Um, so um, the, the, in Yirmi's mouth, in the mouth of Yirmi from, from, from uh, SJG Dutit, that's friendly fire. Uh, 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 he, yes, Yirmi is the brother-in-law of um, the main characters, Daniela and and uh, and um, Daniela Yaari, um, and their husband Amot, uh, and Daniela goes to visit her brother-in-law. Hear me, in Tanzania, where he is uh, helping out those Tanzanian and other African anthropologists. He's like their accountant and book and, and helps them in other ways, like. 
And uh, so she goes there to visit him. He, her sister, his wife has passed away and he is very depressed because his son had died uh, in Tulkarem uh, during an operation, a military operation in Tulkarem. And so it, because of that, he has left. Uh, and so there's, there's sympathy for him, but um, he says to her that he wants to leave the whole message to, the whole message to Jewish and Israeli, just get me out of, here, he says, and this is the explanation that he gives to, to his sister-in-law, shocked sister-in-law. Listen very carefully, we will we'll unpack it. What Jeremy says about, about why he wants to be in Africa. He says, here in Africa, um, I'm reading it to you from, I'm reading to you from uh, the book, but it's a quotation uh, from the novel, direct quotation. Here, he says, there are no ancient graves and no floor tiles from a destroyed synagogue, no museum with a fragment of a burnt Torah, no testimonies about pogroms and the Holocaust. There's no exile here, no diaspora. There was no golden age here, no community that contributed to global, global culture. They don't fuss about assimilation or extinction, self-hatred or pride uniqueness or chosenness. No old grandmas pop up suddenly aware of their identity. There's no orthodoxy here or secularism or self-indulgent religiosity. And most of all, no nostalgia for anything at all. There's no struggle between tradition and revolution, no rebellion against the forefathers and no new interpretation. No one feels compelled to decide if he's a Jew or an Israeli or maybe a Canaanite or if the state is more democratic or more Jewish, if there's hope for it or if it's done for. The people around me are free and clear of that whole exhausting and confusing tangle. But life goes on. I am 70 years old, he tells Daniela, his sister-in-law, and I'm permitted to let go. So if any of you uh, read the news or meet the Sudanese refugees in Israel, we're like, really? There's no rebellion? Uh, really? There's no conflict in Africa? <laughs> really? There's no uh, tradition versus modernity? Really? I mean, uh, are you in Africa hear me? Or where are you? So obviously, what Yumi is saying is that for him personally, as an individual in Africa, he doesn't care. It's their problems. As long as they don't bother him, he is not. So what he says, it's true about maybe him because in Israel, and that's what Yeshua means by total Jew. In Israel, you can't disconnect. Even if you go to those stores that have aromatherapy and you pretend that you're just, you know, what person, it's impossible to disconnect. But neither is it possible to disconnect from the national, global, and et cetera issues anywhere else. But hear me, in Africa doesn't feel that responsibility towards the local troubles. And he's given himself permission to disconnect from his own national uh, troubles. So this, um, um, there's an, another character in the novel, Hakala uh, Meshachreret, that was translated, the, the title was translated as the liberated bride instead of liberating bride. Uh, but one of the liberators finally liberating uh, the groom in that novel is the Arab maitre d'hôtel uh, uh, and, uh, and he says, he says to the protagonist, to Rivlin, says, you Jews, you always at the airport, always coming and going, you can't sit still, it will make you sick in the end. So some characters do get sick 
on their voyages. Einat uh, Lazar, uh, who, uh, who is Michaela's friend in uh, Shiva Mihodu, open heart, she gets very, very sick in India. She gets hepatitis, and this is how the plot of the novel starts. But most of Yoshua's Israelis who travel are invigorated and heal. Uh, for instance, I can go back. Uh, for instance, the, 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 the manager, the human resource manager who goes to the steps of the former Soviet Rep Republic um, with a corpse and learns about the attitude of the people there towards his own hometown, Jerusalem, he heals and becomes invigorated and he comes back much, much stronger and better than he had left. Uh, there's a question whether Michaela is now strengthened by her, you know, that present voyage to India and whether she will come back and be a mother to her daughter and a husband and a wife to her son in uh, Israel. Yair Moses, uh, Yair Moses, uh, the, the protagonist of Chesed Faradi, uh, which is called uh, the retrospective in, in, in the English translation, he is very much reinvigorating, but reinvigorated by his trip to Spain, to Sfarad, because he meets these priests and other people who show that they have overcome at least Yeshua thinks they have overcome um, their um, traditional attitude towards Jews and Muslims and, and, uh, and, and they have become more modern. So even short business trips abroad have the potential to end in perdition, even loss. Yet these voyages are mostly beneficial to the characters from the point of view of their psychological growth, vocational growth and, and, and uh, flourishing uh, spiritual uh, um, openness to new uh, ways of seeing uh, the world and uh, what's beyond daily reality. And above all, these voyages are are a strategy that Yoshua uses to show us, to show us his readers, how other cultures define, imagine, and reconfigure their national identities vis-a-vis um, -vis their history, vis-a-vis -vis their minorities, vis-a-vis -vis their uh, religion, and so forth. So Yoshua, pretty much in all his novels, invites a uh, selective comparison between Israel's predicaments at the time in which he's writing that work and the predicaments of those other cultures that they visit in their past, in, in, sorry, in their present, in relation to their history. So Yeshua is always very, very aware of the cultural history of those places that he uh, uh, to, of, of everything, everything, every place for him has historical depth. So when Yirmi says what he says that I just read to you, oh, here there are no conflicts, no rebellion, Yeshua knows that um, Yirmi is delusional. And, and, and so that, you know, that's the point, the reader gets it. Um, and the question is, 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 is how to create a pragmatic modern Jewish identity in Israel now. That's always what Yeshua is preoccupied with in all his essays, in all his novels, ultimately. Um, so there's a big difference. There's a big difference between Yeshua's largely positive representation of Israelis who travel abroad and interact positively with members of other cultures, religions, races, ethnicities, and uh, Yeshua's largely negative attitude towards Jewish diasporization, and especially his acute frustration with the Odim. Uh, those, the, the, those, those co concert halls in Paris and Berlin, those funeral ghats where the dead are emulated on the Ganges River, the, the African marketplace in Dar es Salaam, those are all vital sources of cultural enrichment for Yeshua's travelers. 
but they also sharpen our awareness of spiritual and social challenges that the Jewish state still needs to confront back home. At the same time, such excursions certainly pose a danger of centrifugal perdition, the potential for an irresponsible loosening of family commitments for the propensity to abandon the homeland. Um, so, you know, I'm concluding here, I'm wrapping up. Um, the world, as you see, can be a dangerous magnet that pulls Yoshua's Jews away from their national and familial responsibilities. But at the same time, any nation around the world becomes a source of invigorating and even exhilarating sense of perspective that elucidates not so much for the characters, also a bit for the characters, but especially for the reader, that elucidates the requirements for reconfiguring a modern Jewish identity at home. Um, so Yeshua is a staunch nationalist who paradoxically, because he thinks, you know, that families are the microcosm of the nation and the nation is where the identity of a people has the best option to work itself out, especially a people uh, that has uh, had so many uh, persecutions and uh, in its history. So um, he's a staunch nationalist who paradoxically sends his characters to explore and interact with every nation around the globe. And he himself, uh, you know, he bases these 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 uh, uh, interactions on on a context that he himself has had. Not and he hasn't gone to all of the places that he describes. For instance, uh, Hashiva Mihodu, the return from India, which was translated. The title is Open Heart. He had not visited India uh, when he wrote that book. He based himself on the guidebooks and the stories that Israelis who travel in India, com com including at that time his son, uh, tell. But afterwards he went to visit when he went to promote the publication of his book there. Uh, but other places, of course, he has traveled very extensively to most of, to I think all the other places uh, that he, that he uh, has described. And um, in the past few years, um, and with this, I, I will conclude and open up for two questions. Um, in the past few years, he, he has been, he's been, been invited to go uh, to Mexico, but now he's, you know, he's in his uh, mid eighties and his wife passed away and there's a pandemic, but he had asked me a couple of times, he says to me, yeah, do you think I should go to Mexico? Now he asked me because I grew up in Mexico. I'm Israeli, born in Haifa, which uh, was in the city. I, I um, um, like him, I come from many generations of Sephardic Jews from Jerusalem on my mother's side and um, on my father's side uh, uh, from uh, you know Hungarian Jews who, who managed to survive the Holocaust and went to Israel but then my, my father worked in Mexico and I grew up there so he says to me hey, do you think I should accept the invitation and go to Mexico and I say to him look yes I think I tell him I think you should go to Mexico because in Mexico you will see that the Aztecs and, and in fact the whole Mexican uh, myth about their origin is that that the the the, the Mexicas, the original Mexicas and the Aztecs, they had or, uh, the, the original people who settled uh, the place the, 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 uh, where today is is you, you, the center of Mexico City, which was a lake. Now it's all filled in with buildings, but but th their myth is that they were somewhere else, maybe in the north, and they had a transcendental revelation that their land was going to be the place where they would find and a little sort of island in the water with a sort of cactus and an eagle on it with a snake 
in its beak. And where they find that, that's going to be their land. And so they're coming from outside, looking for that sign. And when they see that sign, that's the story, the myth, they know that's the land that has been given to them supernaturally by their gods. And that's where they settle. And, uh, and you see that image of the eagle with the serpent in its mouth and the cat goes, on every Mexican seal, on every Mexican coin, on every Mexican everything. It's a central part of modern contemporary Mexican identity. And I say to Yeshua, you will see that it's not just the Jews who have a story that they were wandering in the desert and they were told the promised land, you go back there and then they go and they settle. That the fact that the culture has an identity, national identity or a peoplehood that is, is coming from diaspora is not so special to the Jewish people. And you can't just build up this whole theory about the Golan neurosis based on the fact that they, because here is another peoplehood that also has that. Is, does that make them prone to, to, to dispersion and desperation? So it's always an open conversation. It's always a debate about Yoshua's ideas, his rich novels, and um, and uh, with him, it's a it's a privilege, right, to 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 know him. So I'm going to look at your questions now, and thank you very much for uh, listening. Um, please post a comment of that of that comment from Yumi that you read. Where can I post? How can I post it? It's going to take me too long to do that. Why don't you, Larry and Sharon Feingold and anybody wants, why don't you email me and I'll, and I'll send you a, a snapshot of that uh, statement. Um, and then you, you also, Larry and Sharon, you asked a question. Does Yoshua give us an idea of the solution or the outcomes for the Israeli Jewish identity and goals? That's a tough question. Hmm. Um, yeah, I guess the solution, he never gives the solution. He wants us to work out the solution. But if you see it, what he's suggesting in his um, novels and so forth, it's always, Mutual, evalu mutual validation of each other's identities. So that the Israelis should have a clear idea of their identity as Israelis right now, and that it has to be a pragmatic identity as well as a identity that, it's, if it's an identity, it means it's related to something in the past, in your yeah. own culture, in your own history. So the Israelis have to work that out as Israelis, not as Faradim, Mizrahim, Arab, uh, Arab Israelis, is that the other blah, 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 fragmented, no. But as Israelis work out better their own identity vis-a-vis -vis their sub, sub allegiances, but also to consolidate that and then through those identities, enter into a mutual validating dialogue that is always pragmatic and open to the other. So it can be a Jewish uh, secular Israeli in dialogue, let's say with a Muslim secular Arab Israeli, or it can be a religious Israeli in the dialogue with a secular Israeli uh, or young and old, all of those inter interactions or, or interface between individuals from different backgrounds and different groups in, in Yeshua to understand e each other and to find a modus vivendi. But in order to understand each other, you also have to know yourself. I think that is the solution. Uh, I mean, that he proposes, that he, that he believes in. Um, don't most Mexicans live in 
they do have a diaspora issue now. There are some villages in the north of Mexico that have completely emptied out of young people. They have gone to the United States, whether legally or illegally, um, but they don't have a diaspora issue. No, and that's the thing that most Mexicans do live in, in, in Mexico. But their myth of, of national origins, of course, they have also the Spanish conquest. But still, you know, you can see it in all their seals and that, that image of the eagle with, this, with the serpent. It's important to their national identities. This means this is at the heart of our nation because of this myth. And um, that fact that, they're, that, they're, that they came from elsewhere and that, they, and that they say that they were promised this land doesn't cause them, and because it's given by, by their gods, doesn't cause them, as Yeshua says about the Jews, that this myth of the Jews, it causes us to want to escape. My email address, somebody's asking, just type my name in Google. It will bring you to my McGill website, and you have my email address right there. Um, maybe our host can unmute everyone and people can ask their questions viva voce. Yes, uh, actually you are kindly invited to unmute yourself uh, and you can ask additional questions now. Yeah, I mean, I, um, I did it now for all of you, so you can ask additional questions. Uh-huh. Yeah. So anyway. I have another question. This is Sharon. Um, <clears throat> we uh, need to read a lot of our books on Audible for a variety of reasons, on audiobooks. Um, and how do we encourage that uh, those of Yehoshua's books that have not yet been read in, and performed on Audible uh, be available to uh -huh. Audible readers? Um. Those are contracts that the foreign host, the foreign publishers make with um, sort of Yeshua's agents. So for if you if you publish a book in, in in a country, there's a contract. And then if you publish it in paperback, there's another contract. And if you publish it in audio, there's another contract that you have, the rights have to be purchased by that publisher in that nation. So there isn't really a way to encourage it, um, except, you know, you can write to the publisher of the book that you have in hard copy or in paperback and say, could you turn this into an, could you facilitate the audio version? Or sometimes you can just buy it through Amazon in your own country because like you, or in another country, sometimes it's accessible through Amazon. Does anyone has an additional question to Yael? I, I'm very curious, like what, what uh, drew you to, what draws you to Yeshua? What drew you to this topic of this talk? Oh, well, you know, uh, he's extremely popular both in Israel and abroad. He's like one of the most uh, readable uh, Israeli writers. So we wanted to have um, a lecture about him. Uh, yeah, yeah. But uh, I mean, the, the people who attended the talk. Or they just attend, or you just got just attend any talk from the uh, uh, library? Anyone would like to answer these questions? Well, seems like people are shy today. Yeah. I think people are zoomed out by now. Uh, I just want to say, I think he's a great storyteller. And his characters are very sensitive and you feel you're experiencing their lives very much. Yeah. And that's what the appeal is. Yeah, yeah. What novels have you read? 
Um, I haven't, I've only actually seen a film of one of his books, but I want oh. to read more. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well, I hope that everybody goes and reads uh, more of Yoshua. That, that would be a wonderful thing. Um, yeah, anyone else? Larry, uh, but you, Larry and Sharon, you should unmute you. You cannot wait. I will try, I will try to unmute you. Wait a second. Mm. No, you are unmuted. You have to unmute yourself. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I'm sorry. So, so I, I, Ariel Kleinman, uh, I answered in the chat itself. But Ariel Kleinman asked if, if, if the parallel that I drew here between the Mexica people, uh, who had that myth, who had that myth of the of the of of, of, of the uh, eagle in the middle of the lago. Uh, of Mexico, of what today is Mexico City, uh, that the parallel between the Mexica people and the Jewish people is that uh, I bet Yeshua's idea, or is it my own reflection? It's it's my own parallel, but I've 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 mentioned it to him, but uh, and you know he just listens and he he, <laughs> he just says the same thing over again oh no the jews are worse more prone to having a diaspora neurosis maybe he's right but it's not because of the things that he says it's it's more because of the same things that um shaul that became uh, you know saint paul who was the the mm -hmm mind behind the Christianity, he understood very well that Kashrut and 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 all the all the the, the, the and and, and Brit Milan, all the, the the prescriptions for Jewish identity are too onerous for most people. And therefore the Christians could become um, sort of partial Jews in a sense that they could adopt the monotheistic view and the and idea of the abstract God, but also have it linked to, to uh, a, a new way of doing things and that everything is permitted in terms of eating and uh, there's no need dies necessary and et cetera, et cetera. So from that point of view, there is a, a um, or the Noahide that they have uh, if, if five commandments versus mm. versus ten. So in that sense, yes, we can understand what they're talking about is a kind of discount, this kind of escape or not embracing the full range of mm -hmm. responsibilities or uh, or duties that are related to the identity. Uh, that makes a lot of sense, but Yoshua does not put it from that point of view. Uh, he, he rather embraces Christianity in a sen certain sense, uh, um, the, the, the moral dimension of Christianity. He puts it, as you saw, in geographic, in a geographic point of view, that you go away from the land itself and from the national responsibilities of, of working out the relationship with the others, especially with the Palestinian uh, a partners to the national play space, and especially with the, the wrestling with religion. When he says religion is too important to be left to the religious. Lovely. Yeah, I, I can answer now your, your question of why we chose to come to this lecture. Um, <laughs> um, we are, uh, uh, became Olim, uh, four years ago, after having gone back and forth between Israel and mostly Seattle for all of our lives, and uh, have experienced the neurosis of living in both countries, and um, the, the feeling of always being in airports up until COVID, which put a stop to it in a fascinating way. And I think it brought a lot of Israelis up short, being literally fenced into the country 
but yeah. not through war, but through our own government's restrictions. And it was a fascinating experience. Uh, we've also heard lectures uh, on Yehoshua from other Haifa literary critics and also heard him ourselves within the last year speak to a cultural group in Israel. And we've read was, most of his books. So Fantastic. that your lecture was fascinating Thank and you. it was beautifully delivered. And we're going to be reading your book now. I'll, I'll put up, I'll put up the, I'll put up the, the book um, image. Uh, Esther Berezin, you have your hand uh, up. Uh, Esther, you need to unmute yourself if you want to ask a question. And also Jonathan Hellman. Yeah, El, do you lecture in okay, Israel I... when you return? Do I lecture something? I couldn't hear the whole question. Do you lecture in Israel when you visit Israel? Um, uh, well, I, I have, well, right now it's impossible to know when one can go and cannot go. Um, and my children have been coming here to, the, two of my children are there now. Two of my four children are there, and they have been coming here all summer, so I haven't gone. But when I will go, I will I will set up some lectures. There's also some of the recent lectures that I've given on this book, on different aspects of this this book, uh, are are on YouTube. Um, so again, if you go to my um, or if you email me, I can send you the link because I gave a talk at the Israeli Institute about the book, Israeli Institute of Concordia University. I gave that talk uh, and it's put on YouTube and it explains the whole book. And I gave another talk at the Nazarian Center, um, which is based in UCLA. And that was that is also posted uh, on, on, on Facebook. Or She's 55 years old. Oh, okay. So Esther Berezin, if you're not if you're not able to unmute, you, if you want, just type your question. Yeah, Esther, please type your question. And meanwhile, um, I want to read uh, Yael. I don't know if you have seen, but uh, Alfie Rodden wrote on the chat engaging, thought provoking presentation. Thank you. Thank you. So yeah, um, it's not difficult with Yoshua's ideas and with Yoshua's wonderful fiction. It's not difficult to be engaging and provoking because that's exactly what he is. And I'm privileged to to have been able to work uh, for such a long time and uh, on on his work and be so well acquainted with it. We also have Jonathan Hellman. Maybe you can unmute yourself. Do you have a question? <clears throat> no? Oh, Esther Berezin says, amazed by Yoshua's incredible research in each of his subjects. Yes, Yoshua does conduct very substantial research on the setting wh where he's setting his characters and also on the profession, on the vocation of his characters. So for instance, a character can be an elevator engineer. What does Yoshua know about elevator engineering? So he goes and he visits factories and he sends his manuscript to the experts and he does the the work of the character is is very important to him he has doctors he has judges a lot of teachers that he knows um etc I, I have one of the chapters in my book is about this about the role of the of the work of the characters but it's not just work it's it's a vocation and they usually have a, some type of crisis of of knowledge and responsibility and that too like the voyages is for him a strategy to show us, okay, um, how are you gonna figure things out in order to adapt 
your 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 habits, etc., to what is needed. Um, very interesting. What he sets up these these structures that he has in in my book. So I, in my book, I, I I'll tell you a little bit. I I I I start off by by explaining that Yeshua, what he always creates, is what we can call condition of Israel novels. So even if it's all set in the diaspora, let's say, and in the past, let's say like a journey to the end of the millennium, which is set in the year 999 at the at the time that the Crusades were about to come, even if it's set there, it's still the condition of Israel because what he's after is to understand better the condition of Israel, Israel being the people of Israel, Am Israel, but also the state of Israel right now. And what can we learn from these past experiences and the possibilities that those characters had in those places at those times, what are the options? Um, and then, and then uh, the next chapter is the one that's called um, um, Mapping A.B. Yoshua, which is the one that I, uh, I gave you a, a, a portion of it today, which is about the global locations of Yoshua's uh, novels. And then uh, I, I talk about a certain stance that he creates, which I call the watchman stance. You might notice that his characters sometimes they go stand on a high place and over there they reflect on their relationship with what's around, with the people around. It's a moment of judgment, a moment of reflection. And the reader has to rethink the options. It's always the options that he's interested in. Then I have a, so three chapters that one of them deals with vocation, as I just mentioned. One of them deals with holidays because a lot of Yoshua's books are set during a holiday. For instance, Friendly Fire is set during Hanukkah. And that year, me, his, 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 his sister-in-law, she brings him newspapers from Israel. She brings him Hanukkah candles. And as soon as she gives it to him, he opens the door of the oven and he flings it in and burns it. It's like, that's Hanukkah for him. He doesn't want to know anything about it. But the Israeli protagonist that didn't travel, Amot Ari Daniela's husband, is celebrating Hanukkah every day in Tel Aviv and in Jerusalem. Every day he goes somewhere else, he lights the Hanukkah candle for them, and he tries to figure out how to negotiate the habits of the holiday, the prescriptions for the holiday with the current situation, the current needs. It's like, I don't want to sing mouse too. But I, now today I have to light the candles twice because my grandchild had a fit and wants to light it again. So every day is a pragmatic negotiation of the, the rules and the possibilities of the holiday. And that's, that's uh, the settings uh, of the holidays work in, in also in a way similar to the settings of the cultures abroad. Then I have a chapter on names, because for Yoshua, the names are loaded. So when he has a character called Yirmi, Yirmiyahu, that's a big name. The prophet Yirmiyahu is the one who shouts the most about you're going to be punished with exile. Um, and, 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 and Yirmi talks about the burden of having a name like that. Um, and all the names in Yoshua's books are interesting. You dig over there and you find gold. And, and then I have a chapter about his love plots and how he, the love plots in one generation are burdened by what happened in the past, but the burden of history through the love plots. And then the code, as I mentioned to you, is this playful sort of conversation with Yoshua based on the things that he said to the diaspora Jews uh, at that um, celebration of a hundred year anniversary of support for Israel from the diaspora. He's like, thanks for your support, but we, we need to create the modern uh, Jewish identity in Israel and, and you can only do it, he thinks. I disagree uh, by, by uh, resting with it right there. So uh, we're up to 115. A lot of people stayed on and that's very, very nice. So I think 
I think I'll, I'll, I'll send this back to the organizers to thank you all. And uh, I hope you'll continue reading these uh, works and continue the work of figuring out uh, our, our modern identities, wherever and whatever we are. Yes, uh, yeah, thank, thank you very much for really a uh, wonderful presentation and lecture and bringing uh, closer uh, other videos to us. Traditionally, I will unmute you all now and <laughs> kindly invite us to say uh, hello. Shalom lach Yael, I am speaking Yiddish, but I understand it in English. וחבל שאני לא הבנתי בדיוק מה הנקודה שלך, למה את לא מסכימה עם יהושע? אולי לא הבנתי מספיק את האנגלית, אבל את יכולה לסכם בשתי מילים, למה את לא מסכימה עם יהושע? אני, אני, אני לא לגמרי מסכימה איתו. אני חושבת שהוא צודק במה שהוא אומר, ואני לא חושבת... אני חושבת שהיהודים בגולה, אלה שהם ציונים ואכפת להם מישראל, הם, הם משחקים תפקיד מאוד חשוב. אני, אני, אני הייתי יכולה להגיד, אומרים באנגלית, you can't put all your eggs in one basket. לא שאני חושבת, זאת שאלה כל כך מסובכת, אבל ישראל, יהודים, יש לנו בעיות כמו כולם וגם כן בעיות מיוחדות <laughs> מאוד שנסחבות כבר הרבה מאות ואלפים של שנים זה מסובך וכן יש פנים לכאן ולכאן בואי נגיד בדיוק כן אוקיי okay, תודה okay. תודה רבה לך זה היה and, מאוד 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 So I'd like to say something to the uh, moderator at the National Library of Israel. Um, yes. uh, do you publicize lectures that you sponsor in the English language for those of us who moved there too late to speak Hebrew as beautifully as Yael does? If we do sponsor, or you mean post? Do you, no, do, do, is there a way to get on a mailing list of lectures uh -huh. in English that of the course. National Library of Israel does. And what is that way to do that? Uh, of course, of course, uh, I can add it to our mailing list and you will receive all future lectures. As well, in our library, there is a list of all lectures we did uh, throughout this program uh, and they are all recorded. So I can, uh, I will email you now uh, my address and please send me your email and we'll add you to the newsletter. Doron, thank you and thank the National Library for bringing us this wonderful treasure today. You're very much welcome. This is Jonathan Hillman. I just wanted to say I'm in Toronto and just uh, one of the comments that you made right at the end, which really sort of helped me, on, you asked the question why we're attracted to uh, Yeshua. You used, used the word conditions of Israel. And I guess that's what I hadn't been able to put my finger on. I've always loved his characterization. I was hooked way back when with a, a late divorce and I've sort of followed just about all the others, the characters, the doctors and the, the, the woman in, a late, in uh, Open Heart. Uh, as you said, the characters from the garment worker to the extra in the, in the, the, uh, the one, the latest one, one of the latest ones. So thank you so much. I never appreciated the fact that he had this sort of and whatever antipathy towards the diaspora i just felt he was characterizing israelis of different genres and things which were so fascinating and one of them right in the beginning his his, his three novella one the guy who lives in a forest and watches over the forest so he's a fire watcher or something yeah yeah, yeah. it's it's just was a brilliant little novella so um thank you very much and uh i'm a great fan and, and, Jonathan, and now, sorry, Jonathan. I think you're right, but when you just when you read his novels and his novellas, you don't see any antipathy to no. the diaspora. You do feel the tension, uh, the 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 fear that what's going to happen with this character is it, is he or she going to come back? Right? You do feel that tension. You also feel the tension between. 
for example, someone that he's living in Haifa and he comes to Jerusalem and yeah. you get attention when he goes and, and the religi religiosity of Jerusalem and you feel that kind of tension that, that here's a liberated, enlightened man from Haifa coming with a much more sort of integrated society to Jerusalem. You see that kind of tension, but it yeah. doesn't get other diaspora tension, you're right. And you're right because it's not there. There isn't any antipathy to the diaspora as such. It's part of a very multi-dimensional dialogue on many, many different fronts with people from all over the world, including Jews of different types and, 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 and Muslims and pagans and everything. But it's just in his, in his comments, we, when he's in, in English, he's often talking to American Jews or Canadian Jews, and it's in his interactions with them that it's come that he comes out and says these things, which is also uh, published, for instance, in his book, uh, you know, in his in, in some essays. So that's that's why it's it's there's a kind of separation between his ideological statements and what he actually does in his novels. And yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank, thank you very much uh, again to you all. Thank you, Er. Thank you to all our participants. And hopefully, um, see you next week. And Shana Tova Le Kulam. Shana Tova. Thank you. Bye. Bye.